You know, these are the times, as Thomas Paine say, that try people's souls. And these times are trying ours. Uh, these are times in which our character is being tested, our wisdom, our empathy, our compassion, and our selflessness, they're all being tried. These times are testing our optimism, our faith in our fellow human, in our governments, in our institutions, in our community. And for some, they even, they even test our faith in God. In some, they're trying our souls and the souls of our community. Now, these days, like many around the world, I'm rereading a classic book, The Plague by uh, Albert Camus. And there are many interpretations about that book. It's a classic. And uh, many think that the book uh, used the plague as a metaphor of Nazism that, that had just swept through Europe. Um, but that's not what most struck me about the book. For me, the most intriguing part is how the plague reveals the true nature of, of each of the characters. Dr. Rieu, who's one of the protagonists, is a cynical and detached man, but when the plague breaks out, he becomes a selfless helper of the sick. Joseph Grand is a gray and anonymous city clerk. He lives a boring life. But when the disease spreads, he finds his medal. He forms volunteer groups and he becomes, uh, according to Dr. Rieu, the true embodiment of quiet courage. But then there is also Cotard, which is another character who becomes a profiteer. He sells overpriced items in the black market. They didn't have Purell back then, but you get the idea. And um, Cotard ends up panicking and becomes completely crazy. And then there is the prefect, the mayor of the city, who is only worried about how the plague is going to affect him politically. He first called the plague a hoax. Yep, he can make that one up. Then he calls it just a fever. And then he blames others for the outbreak. When he reluctantly agrees to protective measures, it's too little and too late to make a real difference. So there is a paradox in the plague. We all wear masks to protect ourselves, but in fact, the plague makes the masks fall and reveals who we truly are. So the question for us is what we will see about ourselves when the mask falls. Will we be responsible and wise like Dr. Rieu, or will we be like Cotard, losing ourselves into panic? We will be courageous and empathetic like Joseph Grand, or will we shirk responsibility like the prefect did? As Thomas Paine said, our souls are being tried. And the plague is gonna confront us with who we truly are, not only as individuals, but as countries and as communities. Needless to say, for us as founders, the challenge is even greater because we are in a position of power and influence and our attitude reverberates across the entire community. It is already a truism to say that this pandemic is confronting us with unprecedented challenges. And the challenge, of course, is not just the sickness, but the economic recession that is already upon us. Now, the interconnectedness of the Jewish community made it easier for the, for the virus to spread in the Jewish community. But that interconnectedness also magnifies the impact of the recession. It's hard to say where the chips are going to fall, and what the actual impact of the crisis will be, but we can be sure that whatever happens will create a domino effect that will end up touching the entire community. For starters, four national community systems that are key for Jewish life in North America are going to be particularly affected. One, the JCCs, 50% of them are already in danger of uh, insolvency. Camps, that if they can't conduct summer session, will face a budgetary hole that it will be impossible to surmount. Three, day schools that may suffer loss of students and tuition. And fourth, human service agencies that may crack under the pressure of added caseload on one hand and reduced funding on the other. Now, they are not the only ones, of course. Innovative startups that worked very hard to scale up, maybe now consider superfluous in times of crisis. Many innovative programs will need to compete against basic services. And if they lose, the entire community loses. Synagogues, many of which are teetering in a good year, will have a hard time collecting memberships, uh, a membership fee from an impoverished congregation. In Israel, needless to say, the challenge is double. This crisis finds the Israeli nonprofit sector after a year of not having reliable government budget. It's important to remember 
that all nonprofits face in time of recession a double whammy. They experience a shrinkage of donation and higher demand for services. And then, of course, there's always the most vulnerable. Those that always fall through the cracks of any systemic response, people with mental health issues, people with disabilities, the elderly, Holocaust survivors, minorities, people without families or safety nets. For them, the one is, is not double, but triple or quadruple. So what can we do? First, in this crisis, our funding practices need to change. We can't continue operating with a business as usual approach. We need to cut the nonprofits some slack. When nonprofits are working around the clock, we need to cut our demands for reports and make our application process much simpler and shorter. We need to give nonprofits and designated general operating funds because they need the flexibility to respond very fast to changes in the situation. We need to also cease regarding the 5% payout as if it was Torami Sinai. By law, in North America at least, or in, in the US, the 5% payout is a minimum, not a maximum. If there is a time to dig deeper in our endowment, this is it. This is the rainy day we've been saving for. Now, we forget that, for example, April and May, especially May and June, are, are time of galas, conferences, events, and the like. Uh, many nonprofits depend on these events for their very survival. You know, Jeff knows this from experience. So we don't need to cut those. You can still buy a table for a gala, even if the gala is not taking place. And finally, more than ever, we need to treat our grantees as trusted partners. We need to listen to their evolving needs and offer not only money, but by expertise and guidance, and sometimes simply friendship and support. Our words carry enormous weight. Last week, I was with a nonprofit executive and she received a letter from a foundation. It was a two mail, a two line email. And it simply said, we appreciate all you're doing and don't worry, we have our back. I saw tears of relief on her face when she read it. As funders, we need to look at existing platforms that can be leveraged during the crisis. Families are cooped up at home. We have PJ Library that delivers educational material to 300,000 families. People need loans. We have Hebrew free loan that has been doing that for 100 years. We have a similar structure in Israel. We depend on distant learning. Many of you have been investing in educational technology and web-based learning for years. We need information about how the crisis affects the local community. Your local federation has the finger on the, on the pulse. As in wartime, a car factory can be repurposed to produce tanks. Many of our communal programs can be now repurposed to confront the crisis. And speaking of platforms, we at JFN are committed to help you, to help the community of funders, and the community at large navigate this crisis. Yes, we are sad that we had to postpone our conference, but we don't have the leisure to sit down and lick our wounds. We are in a position of leadership and we need to act and lead now. This crisis finds us, finds us prepared because over the years, we have built a network, a community of peers and colleagues, and now is the time for that network to maximize its connectedness the time for each of us to use the relations that Jeff and help us build, to learn from one another and to find avenues for collective action. Now cooperation is not a nice to have, but a do or die element of our work. So Jeff and is taking several actions to help the community in these critical hours. One, we have started that double database of needs and philanthropic responses, both, both in Israel and in the US. We think it's critical for funders to know what the needs are, but it's also vital to know what is being funded and what isn't. We have sent you all a survey asking you both for what you're funding and what you're hearing from your grantees. Please fill it out. Two, that mapping is gonna help us identify gaps in philanthropic responses. We know from previous crises that a lot of people fund in one sector and enormous gaps remain areas are always being neglected. Three, we are convening conversations among clusters of funders that care about specific issues so that they can coordinate responses to the crisis. In each area, we will seek to identify priorities for philanthropic involvement. Four, 
because the crisis has a lot of unknowns. We are starting a an, an wide scenario planning exercise to help the community be ready for alternative futures that this crisis can bring upon us. This will not predict the future. The future is unpredictable, especially now, but it's going to help us be prepared for whatever that future may be. Thinking about scenarios also will help us identify positive changes that this crisis can catalyze. In history, for example, wars and moments of crisis are big accelerators of scientific research. Think, for example, of the dash to produce penicillin at the end of World War II or the Manhattan Project. So can this crisis also be a catalyst of change? And five, we are having at least a virtual convening a week about the impact of COVID in both Israel and the US. It's important to know that today and tomorrow we'll be talking about issues in general terms 30 or 10,000 feet, but over the next few days, we're gonna dig deeper into each of the issues that are being raised. Uh, Jeff and now has a key role to play. We want to give the community, our community of members, of 2,500 members, the tools to make intelligent and compassionate decisions during the crisis. So besides the activities that we're already conducting, don't hesitate to call us, to consult with us. We are a resource for each and every one of you. And don't hesitate to send us ideas, to send us suggestions of things to do and how to better respond to the crisis. At JFN, we've been talking to you about networking and collaboration for years. Now is the time to leverage the trust that we build with one another. It is true that this crisis finds the world, including America and uh, Israel, at probably the lowest point ever in terms of how much we trust our government, our institutions. But precisely because of that, we need to be able to trust one another. As my friend and colleague Lisa Eisen said at a JFN webinar last week, we can only move as fast as the speed of trust. It's true always, but it's even truer today. My dear friends, the word responsibility comes from the word response. We at Jeff and all of us as a network, and each of us as funders, have the responsibility to respond to this crisis. Responsibility in Hebrew is achrayut, from the word acher, the other. In this crisis, as Marsha said, we need to think of the other. The other that is not as fortunate, fortunate as we are. The other that is worried about a loved one that is being sick. The other one that doesn't know she'll have a paycheck at the end of the month. I know we're all anxious, we're all afraid. This crisis is force feeding us a huge dose of uh, humility. Despite our arrogance, our power, our self-assuredness, despite our technology and our rockets that can reach the stars, there's still a little tiny creature, a single strand of DNA, so small that it's invisible to the naked eye that can bring us down. That dose of humility can also recenter us. It can make us value the important things in life. Think how petty, how insignificant the problems that you were dealing with three weeks ago seem now. And maybe they were insignificant and petty. Maybe this crisis can refocus us in what is truly important. We're anxious and afraid, but one of the advantages of being part of a people with 4,000 years of history is that whatever history can throw at us, we've been there before. We say today what countless generations of Jews have said before us, Gam Zayavor, this too shall pass. And this message of resilience and hope, the belief in a future that will always be better than the past, is something the Jews can give each other and the world. My friends, when we talk about illness and disease, we need to remember that in Hebrew, the word for healing, Lechlim, has a similar root to the word halom, to dream. So this is not the time to stop dreaming, rather the opposite. This is a time to dream of a better community emerging at the other side of the, of the crisis, because there is another side. These are the times that try people's souls, as Thomas, as Thomas Paine said. These are the times that make our masks drop, as Albert Camus said. But when our true self is revealed in the mirror of the crisis, let's make sure that us and the future generations are proud of what we see. Thank you. And if I may have used uh, the mic for a, sec uh, for a second more, I want to thank each and every one of you for your support, your words of encouragement, your empathy, and simply for your mental guide.
especially want to thank the Jeff and board, our chair, George Ed Banner, who have been a rock in this time of crisis, and to the Jeff and staff, both in Israel and in the US, who have been an example of professionalism, selflessness, and commitment during these trying times. So thank you to all, and now back to Marsha for the continuation of the program.